All right, guys. So here we're going to look at Faraday's electromagnetic induction. So to understand, you know, like the the beauty of this this concept, and let's say what actually it represents. Let's go back a little bit and look at just the general DC circuit. For example, if you have a light bulb, and let me do this as a you know symbol for a light bulb in a in a circuit. So which technically nothing but a, a resistor in, in your circuit. So let's say you have a light bulb. In order for the you know for for you to turn on the light bulb and let's say have a light bulb you know technically be turned on in terms of its maximum brightness, you you take it and you connect it to some kind of battery. So here's your battery. So you take wires and connect it both sides, right? So here's point A, here's point B. This is the terminal of the battery. So then there's gonna be current. So I is the current going through the, you know, uh, through those wires, which are, we call it ideal wires. Then they go through the battery, uh, sorry, through the light bulb. And generally the way that, um, let's say the light is generated is when those charged particles that move through the through those wires, right? What we call current. Remember, the current is the flow of charges. Go through the filament and collide with all those particles inside the filament. And those collisions convert the potential energy of the charge carriers into heat energy, and that heat energy is then radiated. And then you see, you know, the the light from the light bulb. I think what you see is that actually the the generated heat, but heat um, is technically like a glowing, right? It glows at uh, the uh, at the visible spectrum, so we can actually see that. So that means what we have here is, um, so this current here, right, is required for the, for the light bulb to, you know, to shine brightly. And what you need here is a battery source. That means something that uh, drives those charges to go around. That means, for example, if I disconnect the light bulb from the battery, Right, so if I disconnect, then you know the light bulb basically will turn up, so it not be you know bright anymore. Um, and one of the things we have here is you know we can you know this is something intuitive, right? So we have something that in order for you to have a you know to turn on the light bulb, you need a power source. In this case, a battery. Well, one thing we also learned here is that if you have a wire, right? So those those wires with the current running through them. So just, you know, kind of like separately from this, you know, diagram, so think like this, that there's a wire here and we have seen this before already, right? If there's a current running through the wire, then it was discovered that the current through the wire generates magnetic field. And remember this magnetic field kind of curls around like this, right? So basically in this case, using the right hand rule, we can find the direction of the magnetic field where this is a different right-hand rule, where your thumb basically gives you the direction of the current, and then your fingers basically curl in the direction of the, uh, let's say, magnetic field. So you can see, right? So something like this. Uh, so you have your thumb in the direction of the current, and then you curl your fingers, and it will tell you in which direction the magnetic field, because it's, it's uh, sort of like, let's say, goes around and loop around, those, the, 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 around that wire. This is the magnetic field generated by this, you know, by the source, which is the, the current carrying wire. That means if there is no current, there is no magnetic field. What generates those, you know, that magnetic field, the charges, the moving charges, right, inside, inside that wire. So that, you know, that's what pretty much we call current. Now think of like this. So this is, this was a major discovery, right? This was, um, connection between electricity and magnetism. It showed that current generates magnetism. That means, you know, what is a current? Well, it's electricity, right? Moving charges, and they can generate magnetic field. So once this was discovered, then Faraday and others try to see if the other way around is also true. That means you can get electricity from magnetism. Okay, so you can get electricity from magnetism. So that, you know, the Faraday, uh, and, you know, like, let's say Lenz and, you know, other, you know, scientists try to, you know, figure out how to generate electricity from a magnetic source. And obviously we have two magnetic sources, right? So we have a bar magnet 
or you know another source here is just a current carrying wire generating magnetic field. But in any case, so what we're going to do in this experiment, we're going to look at and investigate some of these experiments that were done by Faraday. So uh, Faraday, Henry, you know some of those you know uh, scientists in in um, in nineteenth century, they did a lot of experiment in trying to figure out. Right, in trying to figure out the connection between electricity and magnetism, but mainly in terms of how to generate electricity from magnetism. And we still, you know, use some of those, you know, let's say experimental discoveries, right? You know, some of the um, everyday, let's say, applications of the Faraday's law of induction is when you're swiping your credit card. When you're swiping your credit card, there is a magnetic, you know, strip right on the credit card. And when you swipe, it you know, basically allows you to uh, purchase something. So you cannot just put your credit card there and then purchase, right? You have to like swipe it. And we're gonna see why you have to move that, right? Why you have to move your credit card, right? So you know, make swipe, you know, your credit card in order for that, you know, transaction to, you know, to let's say apply. All right, so let's look at then in terms of this. So two things that we kind of preliminary, right? Is that you need some kind of uh, a power source for the for, to turn on the light bulb, that means you know the the power source in a way is this. So what the power source allows um, is basically those charges, right? Those charge carriers to move through the filament. There has to be you know motion of those charge carriers through the filament of the light bulb to turn on the light bulb. And the charge carriers, remember, can be positive ones, can be negative ones. So when I give you the direction of the current, I'm technically giving you the direction of the positive charge carriers. The negative charge carriers, in a way, move in the opposite direction. But in any case, so you need those charge carriers, the moving charge carriers, right, uh, in order for the turn on the filament. OK, so the way then Faraday um, discovered this, uh, what we call electromagnetic induction, to, he, he, he did some experiments where, you know, I'm going to basically show you in terms of the more or less the setup of those experiments using a simulation. Let me, so I'm gonna use this simulation um, to do the demonstration or also, you know, we're gonna use this for our lab. We start with the, you know, the simple case where you have a bar magnet. The, the important thing here is to understand how if you have a bar magnet, it generates magnetic field all around in the space, right? So you can see that, um, one of the things we have, right? The compass allows us to, you know, see the poles, positive, you know, the like North Pole, South Pole. Also, in terms of the the compass, will tell us the direction, right, of the, you know, the magnetic field. That means if you're dealing with uh, a bar magnet, then this is pretty much the magnetic field. So it's kind of goes like this. This one. Um, kind of goes like that. Then you have another one that goes like this, and then you have another one, more or less, right? So so you have this one's kind of like go from north to south. So one of the important thing about the, the magnetic field is to remember that they don't really stop at the south. So they technically go through the magnet and come out from the other side. So all of them kind of go around in a loop, but we don't really care about that for now. So. What we care about here is this. So there is a magnetic field generated by a bar magnet. So this is one source of the magnetism, right? Magnetic fields, which is a bar magnet. And one thing we can see here is, um, so for example, if I'm comparing this magnetic you know, field with this one over there, you can see, right? There's a little bit of you know, um, brightness, darkness, right? To those. Um, the one that is a little bit brighter is generally means stronger in terms of its magnitude. The one that is a bit fainter, weaker in terms of its magnitude, which makes sense because this guy here, let's call this B1, is closer. This one, which is B2, is further away. So closer you are to the source, stronger you are, generally. That's that's for the, for the magnetic field strength. So we can even see that by taking out the, the meter, uh, let's say that the, you can uh, we have a field meter. So if I put it right here, you can see right it's 7.4. If I put it right there, it's 0.42. By the way, the units here, um, given in terms of Gauss, not Tesla. 
So one thing we know here is the unit for the magnetic field here is Tesla, that's the SI unit. But actually before Tesla, um, which, you know, Tesla was a scientist, you know, in 20th century, right? Um, but they knew about magnetic field before Tesla and units for the magnetic field before Tesla was Gauss. After, you know, remember, remember Gauss was live, probably, probably studied that um, in your lecture class. So Gauss, um, in a way, still used, is, is still used as a unit of magnetic field, but we mostly use it when we talk about Earth's magnetic field, because Earth's magnetic field is basically what we call one Gauss. So one Gauss is Earth's magnetic field strength. So then, which is roughly 10 to the negative five Tesla. But in this case, for example, uh, we don't really care about measurement so much, more like, let's say comparing. You can see right here is 0.4 Gauss. Here is, you know, about 10 Gauss, which means that, you know, 10 times stronger field, you know, at, you know, at this position one. That means closer you are, stronger the magnetic field. Now, again, we can have the compass giving us the direction. That, that means, you know, let's say magnetic field here pointing, you know, toward the South Pole, which should make sense, right? Because see the red of the compass is the north of the compass. And it's always attracted to the south of another, you know, let's say magnetic source, because this needle of the compass is itself, itself a magnet. So, and you, you should remember, right? So if you have a, two magnets, so let's say you have north here, south over there. So it will always be attracted toward another south. That means north will be attracted toward another south. Okay, that's why the north of the compass will always point toward the south of the, you know, another magnetic source. All right, that means what we have here is the bar magnet is basically going to be used to demonstrate um, this electromagnetic interaction. But it, it's important for you guys to basically understand, right? So that means, for example, if I move the magnet like this, right, you can see, right, so that point that I had before, so let's say here I had that one point representing the strength of the magnetic field. Now it will be different. So that means because I moved the magnet, so that point now has a different magnetic strength, which you can see if I bring the meter there, remember it was about you know 10 Gauss, now it's about 0.4, uh, 0.35 Gauss. Why? Because the source is moving. Closer the source is to that point, stronger the magnetic field further away, you know, weaker the magnetic field. That means what I have here is, again, you can see, right? A little bit of bright, bright, brighter compared to a little bit fainter, you know, the color of those, you know, uh, you know, well, these are kind of like the magnetic fields, right? Um, will tell you more or less about the magnitude. Now, one thing we have here is this. So remember, as I said, right? So if you have a light bulb, so again, so this is, you know, the, the, the light bulb, in order for me to have um, you know, turn on the, 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 the light bulb, I need to have a power source. That means, you know, I need to connect it to some kind of battery, okay? And then, you know, the current will flow through the, uh, through the light bulb and, you know, you can turn on the light bulb. But as I said, right, if you remove the battery, then there is no, you know, it's basically it's off. So that means imagine like this, right? So imagine you have a light bulb um, connected to just a loop of wire like this, okay? And the wire itself is not connected to anything. There is no, there is no basically power source connected. That means all, all, all I have here is two ends of the, the light bulb just connected to one another by just some kind of ideal wire. And that's what we're gonna do by when we look at um, right here, a pickup coil. Okay, so let's go over here. So let me actually clean it up right there. Okay. 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 So let's move magnet over here. So what what I have here is this. So you have a light bulb. So basically, this is this is our uh, this is our light bulb, and you can see right, it is connected to just a coil of wire. Okay, which means that there is no source at all. There is no power source. You just you know just basically have a light bulb, and it's connected to some kind of you know just coil of wire. Okay. The the idea here is. It's, it's still a conducting wire. So there are charges there. There are, you know, free charges that can technically move around, but there is no power source to drive them to, you know, some specific direction. 
remember, in order for the current to, you know, for you to have a current in, in your wires, right, um, you need to have a power source or some kind of electric field, right, that pushes them. And in this case, what I have here is, you know, you just have a light bulb connected to a wire, no power source, so the, the light bulb is off. Now, the initial setup of Faraday, you can think of it like, was like this. So he's like, okay, so the idea is this. If you have a wire with the current running through that, remember, right? With the current running through that, then it basically generates magnetic field, right? Generates magnetic field. That kind of goes counterclockwise in this case. That means, you know, if you have a current in a wire, then you have a magnetic field. Now, is the opposite is also true. Well, what, what we have right now is this. So you have a magnet, bar magnet, that technically generates magnetic field in, all, in, in this entire region, right? So thing like this. So there's a magnetic field that kind of goes like this, magnetic field that kind of goes like that, you know, the direction magnetic field that kind of goes like this. That means there is a magnetic field through the center of that loop. Okay. So, but obviously, you know, you can see the light bulb is off, which means that what he realized is that if you have a magnet, which generates a magnetic field through the, uh, let's say, through the loop, right? Uh, it, it has no effect. There is, there is no electricity generated. All right. So let's see, we can have some options here. We can have a compass showing that, you know, there is indeed um, a magnetic field there. See the magnetic field always points in the direction of magnetic field. So that means you can see, right? There is a direction of magnetic field from left to right. Okay. We can also have a meter. So one thing I can do, I can see that exactly at the center of the loop, I have 0.54 gauss. So that means there is a magnetic field. Okay. Now, one thing we can do here is we can actually calculate a quantity that is known as magnetic flux. All right, so let's calculate that magnetic flux. So what I have here is there is no electricity there right now, but actually there is what we call a magnetic flux. So magnetic flux written like this is equals to the magnetic field, magnitude of the magnetic field, then times the area A through which the magnetic field is moving. All right, so now what is this area? Well, this area represents pretty much this region over here, the area of this loop. Okay, so because it's a circular loop, right? So the area is equals to pi r square. And I can see, right? So there's a, you know, there's a magnetic field through that center of the loop or you know, through this area of the loop. So I can calculate, let's say a flux, a magnetic flux. So magnetic flux by basically bringing the meter here and I can see, right, I can measure the magnetic field, you know, uh, which you can see, right, it's a very little deviation. That means everywhere at the center, the magnetic field almost about the same strength. And obviously, you know, that region has an area. So B times A gives me magnetic flux. Okay, so B times A gives me magnetic flux because let's say we can assume that magnetic flux is a, you know, uh, due to the magnetic field, there is perpendicular to the area of the plane of that coil, right? So that means it's perpendicular to the area of the plane. And the, the equation is just B times A. All right. So now the takeaway here is this. He looked at, you know, this experiment. He had a mag uh, the bar magnet around this, you know, coil, um, you know, basically his loop of wire. And he realized, okay, so if, I'm, if I have the, the, the magnet there sitting there, you know, I can wait half an hour, I can wait two hours, nothing happens. So by the way, like, let's say, for example, this guy here shows that instead of a, a let's say light bulb, we can have a, for example, a, a, some kind of a meter that measures um, that the voltage is zero between the ends of that, you know, if, if it was a light bulb, right, there's no there's no potential difference between the end of the light bulb. That's why there is no, no current. Well, remember, because there's no power source over there. All right, so then one thing we can have here is this. Okay, so obviously the Faraday was one of the best experimentalists. So he, you know, he didn't stop here. 
he started doing experiments. Next experiment was this. All right, so let's say, let's clear this here. What he did was this. So what if, you know, I start moving this magnet? So then he decided to, you know, put the magnet somewhere else. So let's say he put it, uh, let's say he put it here. Nothing, he put it there, nothing. Then maybe he moved it and let's say this is on the way, put it somewhere over there. And basically, you know, if you look at it again, if I put it there, nothing happens. But hopefully you guys notice, right? So when it was moving, there is some reading over there and look at the charges. It seems like charges are moving. That means one thing he noticed is that if you have a stationary magnet and what you have here is that, for example, you can calculate the flux there. Here's the flux. Let's call this, you know, position one. So position one is magnetic strength when the magnet is position one times area. Okay. Now, what he noticed is that as soon as he starts moving the magnet, there is some kind of change. Look at that. Look at the meter. See, look at the meter when it's moving. It fluctuates to the left when it's approaching. And then when it's moving away, it fluctuates to the right. So what he realized here is when you have a magnet that is moving relative to the, you know, to this coil, there seemed to be a motion, like let's say, let's say there's a current, right? Those charges inside this wire, inside this coil moving. And you can see, right? If I move a little bit faster, there is even faster move. Like let's go back to the light bulb, see what happens. See, if I move, see, you're able to turn on the, the light bulb. So what you have also look at, look at the, the motion of those charges. They're moving in one direction. They're moving now in opposite direction down then they move up and that's also very curious why is it moving down here but it's moving up over there and if you see if, if i kind of move move it fast back and forth well you have the light bulb that is on okay so this was one of his discoveries is that what you have here is when you are moving the magnet relative to the you know to your coil then you have a current in that coil Remember, this coil is not connected to any power source and it's not even physically touching the magnet. But as soon as I have a moving magnet, then the charge is moving inside, which means then what we can say here is that there is now a current inside that coil. We call that induced current. So induced current, I induced, so like let's say. So induced current, well, whenever there is a current, you know, that means there's a potential difference between, right? Remember, well, if, I, if I use a voltmeter, you can say, right, there's a potential difference, non-zero between that. That means, you know, this induced current right away gives you induced EMF, okay? This gives you induced EMF. Now, that means one thing we can see here is that indeed you can create electricity from a magnet, okay? But, it has to be a moving magnet. So that means, you know, only there is an induced current when the magnet is moving. See, I put it inside and it's just sitting there. Again, no voltage, charges are not moving. I start moving, then there is a current. That means what we're gonna do, we're gonna investigate. What is the best way to create an induced current? Do we move it transverse direction relative to the coil? Transverse means that perpendicular to the you know perpendicular like up and down that's what transverse is something like this so you have external external means that external from the coil so external trans transverse transverse uh, or um, longitudinal that means we have kind of like two different you know direction that we can move okay so again so like let's say we have transverse and I have that you know in the, in the, in a um, in the lab you can see right transverse this is you know kind of up and down and longitudinal back and forth, okay? Then you have transverse here, back and forth, or, you know, you go over here, transverse back and forth, or you go through the inside, transverse back in longitudinal, you know, or, or, or a transverse. And you kind of like, let's say, 
which one is the best one, where do you get the highest, you know, let's say induced EMF, right? Or induced voltage and so on and so forth. Now, one thing we can do here is this. Remember, so let's say when the, the magnet is here, I can measure the magnetic field strength inside. And I can use that to calculate magnetic flux. As I said, right, this is position one. So this is, this is basically position one of the, of the magnet. And what we have here is this is the magnetic flux. So it will be 1.13 uh, Gauss times whatever the area of, the, of that coil. Now, one thing we have here is then, see if I move the you know, magnet closer, see the magnetic field changes. Magnetic field changes. Okay. Now, if I, if I move it here, so you can see right now I can say, okay, here's two. So magnetic flux two is B2 times A. And we can see, right, in this case, so I have a magnetic flux when the magnet is at point one. Now I have a magnetic flux when the magnet is at point two. And you can see, right, there is a difference. In, you know, there's gonna be a difference in flux. Why? Because now I have a much stronger magnetic field, okay? So one of the things that Faraday then uh, basically discovered, right? Or, and he, he was able to write it in equation is that um, you can then basically connect or, or find the relationship between this induced EMF and, you know, this ma ma magnetic flux. Because for example, see what you have here is this. Look at now, I have a flux which is, you know, magnetic field strength right now when the magnet here is in position two, right? So let's say when the magnet here is in position two, so I have a flux. Well, but look at it, I have a flux, but voltage is zero. That means there is, new indus there is no induced EMF. Induced EMF is zero. I do have a flux. Again, I have a flux because there is a magnetic field, non-zero magnetic field, right? Inside, you know, you know in on the plane of the, of the coil and it has an area. So the product gives you a flux. And there was a flux when the magnet was here. That means now there's also flux. That means induced current is not dependent on flux because now I have a flux, but there is no magnetic, you know, there is no induced current. Here, I have a flux. And again, there is no induced current. But what happens here is this, you realize that only when the flux is changing as a function of time, see, Let's say if you put it this meter here, you can see, right? What you're doing, you're changing, changing as you go as a function of time. See the magnetic field constantly changes, which means flux is changing. That means when the flux is changing as a function of time, then you have an induced current, okay? So his contribution was that he realized that this induced EMF is proportional to the change in magnetic flux, uh, you know, as a function of time. That means the rate at which the magnetic flux is changing. Okay. Now, um, one thing we can also, obviously, you know, he was, a, as I said, a very good experimentalist. So he played with other things as well. And mainly was, let's say, what happens if you have, you know, let's say more number of loops, so larger number of loops. So let's say, will it be, you know, let, let's see maybe from here, right? Will it be brighter when we have let's say three loops compared to just one loop. And I imagine you can see the difference, right? Look at the maximum brightness you get when you have one loop. And then, you know, maximum brightness we have when you have like, let's say uh, three loops. You can see, right, it's much higher brightness, you know, uh, because of the increasing number of loops. That means one of the things we end up with is this. There's an equation where I can say that induced EMF is equals to n times change in flux, where n is the number of loops, right? So, so change in flux is a function of time. So this is our equation, okay? This is how we can use to find change in flux as a function of time times the number of loops that will give us induced EMF, which means that you can generate electricity without any batteries. You can generate electricity by just having a moving magnet, okay? which then in a way, you know, we can mathematically represent as a, you know, as the magnet changes through the coil, that means, you know, the magnetic field strength changes, which means that the flux changes. So 
changing flux gives you electricity okay so that was a very you know important discovery and in this lab what we're going to do here is you can see right this particular uh simulation has bar magnet pickup coil electromagnet transformer generator so i'm going to have you guys only do the two pickup coil and electromagnet so and uh, the rest you can just play on your own you know kind of like you know discover new things you know on your own but you know you won't have to do that for the for the for the lab so for example here you know when you have an electromagnet so one of the things we have here is this right so let's say um i have here a, a coil with a battery connected so what we do here is you can see that you have a coil connected to the battery and you have a current inside well i mean we can have a current inside if we then have a battery source you know giving you polarity you know basically in one direction compared to the polarity in the opposite direction so one thing we have here you can see right so uh this is the magnetic field generated by this you know a current running through the uh through the through those loops so and you can see that in terms of if you can use a compass right you can see right the direction of the magnetic field if you have a you know the right side to be positive or the left side to be positive you can see right how the direction of the magnetic field changes it also allows you to you know play with um, ac or a dc source so you have a, here an ac source which compared to the dc so you can see the differences between when you have a dc and ac source for example if you go to the dc source um See, let's say if you want to change the magnetic field strength, you can see right, right now magnetic field is zero because the, the power supply gives you zero uh, potential. So you go increasing like this and you can see right the magnetic field strength increases. Then you can go all the way around. So you can see right magnetic field strength technically increases, decreases, but in the opposite direction. But you can see right to do that, you have to do everything manually. If you have an AC source, then in a way so if you go so if you go back here and then you play this you can see right so like this so it has the charges moving and then you have the magnetic field but magnetic field technically you know if you see right the strength doesn't change okay as long as you have a set magnetic you know a set potential right the voltage and you generate magnetic field but the strength doesn't change okay so that means for example if I put some kind of coil right here with a light bulb, this is kind of like, let me, let me do the, the light bulb here. So this is my coil. And let's say this is the light bulb with the filament. So think like this, if I have a light bulb and I have this, this setup over here, uh, what I have here is it generates magnetic field and this magnetic field has a, you know, generates flux through the coil, right? Um, but, you know, there's gonna be no induced EMF. So induced EMF in this case will be zero because there is no change in flux. So there is a flux which is B times A, but in, it's not changing, right? It's not changing, you can see, right? So if you, if, you, if you have the magnetic field strength over there, 1.25, it doesn't change. But what I, what I can do here is this. So if I now change then the voltage, then magnetic field is changing. And so as soon as I do that, then there's gonna be, um, you know, there will be, a, the, the, the light will turn on, okay? So that means, you know, if I'm using just kind of like, let's say changing this constantly so that magnetic field st strength changes, then I can have, you know, I, I can turn on the, the light bulb. Okay, but I have to do that all the time manually. But if I have an AC source, then AC source can actually do that on its own. See, it constantly changes back and forth, back and forth. And that's what we have in our households. 
AC source, which constantly goes back, currently goes back and forth, back and forth. And you can see, right? I don't have to do anything. So just basically, if I have an AC power supply, it constantly changes everything and the light bulb will be, which will turn on because this flux, you can see, right, constantly changes. And EMF is number of turns times changing flux over time. And that's kind of what we have, delta, delta T, sorry. That means in this case, right, if you're using AC source, then you have a turn on, you know, the light bulb constantly because of the direction of the current changes and then the current um, will be induced in the coil because of then the magnetic field basically changes. All right, so the last thing that I'm gonna talk about here is this. So why is there a, the different, you know, let's say if, if, if we go back to, let's say pickup coil over here. So when we're talking about, so when we talk about in terms of the magnetic, you know, uh, sorry, the, the voltage, right? See when this is when this is moving, you know, uh, from left to right. Look at the, the the needle goes, you know, deflects to the left. Then when it's moving away, it deflects to the right. So again, when it's moving toward, deflects to the left. When it's moving away, deflects to the right. And it's also very interesting, right? Why does it do that? Well, there's a relatively simple way of explaining this, and it was done by. Um, you know, somebody named Lenz, she's called a Lenz's law. So let's go back and look at, let's say what Lenz's law technically, you know, explained about this, All right? So let's go back here. Okay. So let's look at in terms of explanation. It's a, it's a relatively nice conceptual explanation of the direction of the induced EMF. All right, so this is again, as I said, right? It's known as a Lenz's law. Okay. And the way the Len, you know, the way Lenz explain is like this. So thing like this. So yeah, let's let's say you have a coil like this, right? Let's say you have a coil, okay. And in you know, let's say you have a magnetic field, kind of goes like this. Okay. So you have a magnetic field, that means going through the you know this area of the loop, right? It's basically in the, in the upward direction, okay? Now, the question is that, is that a flux right now? Is flux zero or is it non-zero? Well, you can see, right? There's a magnetic field perpendicular to the area of the plane. Well, there is a flux. So let's, let, let me call this like, let's say initial flux. So this will be the magnetic field strength initial times then the area. That means now I have a flux. But remember, if I if you have a flux and the flux is not changing, that means there is no current. So that means in this in this coil, right, that I have, there is no induced current. So I, right now, if the you know if this is constant, then induced current, right? That means induced EMF, which is equals to n times change in flux over time, uh, and induced current, both of them are equals to zero. Both of them are equals to zero. Now, what do we do in order to change to to have a let's say then um, uh, let's say induced EMF and induced current? Well, we change the flux. Now, how do we change the flux? Well, there are a number of ways we can change the flux. Mainly, you know, let's say two main ways that you can see from this equation is that well, we can change increase or decrease magnetic field, or we can change increase or decrease the area of the coil. That means I can make the coil smaller or bigger or big, even bigger, right? Or even smaller. And that can actually change the flux. But let's concentrate right now in terms of just changing the magnetic field strength. Because in a way, as I said, right? So that you can change the flux also from the, uh, you know, the area, but to describe or explain, you know, the direct direction change of the EM, you know, this EMF and the current, just looking at a change of magnetic field is enough. All right, so again, so let's see. This is this is my initial magnetic field. And it's upward. And let's say it, it has some value. I don't know, let's say, let's say 20, 20 Tesla, for example, right? So it is now 20 Tesla. But imagine that, you know, there is a way of changing. That means, you know, imagine there's a dial and somebody starts 
slowly turning the dial. It means slowly increasing the magnetic field such that magnetic field changes as a function of time. That means every second, let's say it's increasing by one Tesla. That means it's 21, then 22, then 23. That means every second there is a change in magnetic field. Okay. So, and that increase in magnetic field will be, you know, making this magnetic field increasing in the same direction, right? Because it's, you know, it's up and it's increasing. So as our arrow that I present, it will be sort of like, let's say it's increasing in this direction. So the arrow is going to be longer and longer because, you know, the magnitude is increasing. Well, now what we have is this, because the magnetic field is changing, right? Magnetic field now increases. Well, which means that flux will also increase. Remember the flux is written like this. It's equals to B times A. Now what I'm saying here is that I am now changing magnetic field as a function of time. There's a change in magnetic field as a function of time, which means that if the magnetic field changes a function of time, well, so is flux because you know they are directly related to one another. Well, if, if I'm changing the flux, then you know I have an induced EMF because induced EMF due to the fact that there is a change. That means induced EMF is basically directly due to the fact that there's a change in flux. Now, wh wh why, why then let's say there's induced EMF? Well, things like this. Everything like to be in equilibrium. And right now the loop itself, right? The loop, you know, was under constant magnetic field. So it, it had 20 Tesla magnetic field strength. And now you're changing the magnetic field strength. You're increasing. Well, the loop going to try to prevent that. So it's going to try to oppose that change in magnetic field. And the only way it can oppose is by trying to decrease that magnetic field. So think like this. Right now, there's an increase in magnetic field, right? Magnetic field is increasing. That means somebody, as I said, right? This is an external source. This is some kind of external magnetic field source. And somebody is increasing the dial, right? Slowly, every second, it's increasing the magnetic field by one Tesla. Well, if it's increasing magnetic field by one Tesla, then one thing that the coil can do is basically try to prevent that increase in magnetic field by generating its own magnetic field, by generating its own magnetic field that is exactly opposite to the type of change that we have. And you can see, right? So this is represents that change in magnetic field. That means it's increasing change, right? Increasing change. So then the loop will try to then prevent that by generating its own magnetic field that is in the opposite direction. That means then this change will be exactly same as the increase, but in the opposite direction. So then they can cancel each other. So the loop will gonna try to prevent increased magnetic field by again, what we call inducing its own magnetic field. So be induced. That means the loop out of nowhere decides to generate its own magnetic field. How, how can the magnetic field be generated by the loop? Well, remember loop can generate magnetic field if there is a current in the loop. That's why I started with that, right? If you have a, you know, if you have a loop, or if, you have, if you have a wire with a current running to that, it generates, it generates magnetic field, okay? So it generates magnetic field. And if you have a loop like this, the magnetic field it generates, let's say at least, you know, through the center of the, through, through the loop, it's gonna, it's gonna kind of go like this. It can go like this, down or up, depending in which direction. So for example, the loop generate magnetic field. That means if there is a current in the, in the loop, it can generate magnetic field either up or down, that means you know, through the, through the, through this area, right? It's going to be either up or down through the center of the loop and up or down depends on what type of, in which direction is our current. So for example, if our current is clockwise, if our current is clockwise, then there's going to be a magnetic field generated that will be downward. Now, how do we know that? Well, using a right-hand rule, right-hand rule. That means what I can do here is this right-hand rule uses only um, basically direction of the current and direction of magnetic field. This is not the, you know, the right-hand rule for the force. 
I'm, I'm sure you guys learned that, you know, you will learn it from the, from the lecture portion. So the, this right-hand rule, basically, um, the best way to do that for this particular, if you have a loop, right, if you have a loop, is then to use the thumb for as a direction for the magnetic field. See, when you have a wire, straight wire, with a current in it, your right hand then gives you the thumb as a direction of the, you know, current, and then your fingers will curl in the direction of the magnetic field, like this, right? Okay. So then it will be in the direction of the magnetic field. So you curl your, your fingers in the direction of the magnetic field, your thumb is the direction of the current, so then you can see, right, so the magnetic field has to be, then in this case, counterclockwise. But if you have a loop, then in this case, you turn your fingers in the direction of the current and your thumb will give you the direction of the magnetic field. That means in this case, what you will see is that, you know, if you have your fingers kind of, you know, turning like this, right? I don't to do that. That means clockwise, right? Then your thumb will be straight down. So that means, you know, kind of curling like this. If you curl your fingers in a direction of clockwise, your thumb pointing down. Okay, that means current, clockwise current gives you downward magnetic field through this loop. And if you have a current that's gonna be, let's say, counterclockwise, like this, then in that case, what you have here is you curl your fingers in the direction of the current and your thumb then will be pointing, pointing up, okay? So where your thumb is the direction of the induced magnetic field. That means if you have a counterclockwise current, there's gonna be a magnetic field generated by this current in the wire. I mean, you know, through that loop, right? Uh, that's gonna be, you know, upward direction. Again, this is directly from the fact that their charges are moving in that wire or in that loop. Now, going back over here, we have this. As you increase the magnetic field, you know, external magnetic field, the loop, because this, this is a wire, right? This is, this is a wire that we bend it into a, into a loop. So this wire generates then current, but it has to generate current such that magnetic field is opposing the change of the external magnetic field. So since external magnetic field is increasing upward, that means induced magnetic field should be then downward to cancel it. Well, in that case, in order to have a downward magnetic field, the current, according to, you know, these two things that I drew, right? Either this one or that one, well, it has to be downward, so it will be this case. So then the current will be clockwise. So there's gonna be clockwise current in your circuit, in your loop, so that there's a downward magnetic field. So it tries to prevent it, okay? That means if you're increasing magnetic field, external magnetic field, then there is an induced magnetic field by the loop to prevent that. So that's why in order to create that induced magnetic field, it has to induce current. And in order for, to induce current, it needs to induce EMF. That means induced EMF gives you the current, current gives you the induced magnetic field, which tries to prevent the increase in the external magnetic field. I don't, it seems like, you know, out of some kind of, you know, a fantasy, right? Like a science fiction, but it's actually science fact. So the loop that's just sitting there suddenly has a current running through that because you're changing the external magnetic field through the center of the loop. Well, same way you can think of like this. If again, if this is your loop, okay, if this is your loop, and then let's say you have this external magnetic field like this. So this is your external magnetic field. And let's say this is again, 20 Tesla, right? We started with that. Um, while, as long as this magnetic field is constant, there is no current in this loop. But as soon, as soon as you have a change in the external magnetic field, and put like XT, EX, so that you know it's external. As soon as you have a change, then there's the induced current. For example, now let's say the magnetic field is decreasing. So we're dialing down. That means, you know, the change in magnetic field in this direction, right, downward. I mean, in a way that means it's decreasing. That means new magnetic field is like this and then like that. So we are decreasing the 
external magnetic field. Well, again, this loop doesn't like that. It enjoyed a constant magnetic field. Now, as you decreasing magnetic field, it again tries to put it back to toward you know, kind of toward this equilibrium, what it was, you know, oppose this change. Well, since external magnetic field is decreasing, this loop gonna try to pump magnetic field in the same direction as it was before, so that you know, basically put it back to the original value. Well, that means you know somebody is decreasing the magnetic field strength, external magnetic field strength. The loop gonna try to increase magnetic field strength. In order to do that, it has to pump magnetic field in the same direction as was the original. So basically, exactly opposite of the direction of the, the change. Well, that means the B induced, right, induced magnetic field has to be upward in this case. Well, in order for it to have F, uh, upward magnetic field, induced magnetic field, then you can see, right, the current in the loop has to be, current has to be then counterclockwise in that case. So counterclockwise loop, uh, the current in the loop gives you upward induced magnetic field to cancel this change. So this is what exactly the Lenz's law gives you. It's uh, like a conceptual, you know, um, explanation of why the current changes. Because think like this, if we go back right now to the simulation, so you can see what I have is this, when I'm initially, look at, look at, you know, the, the strength, you know, field reader. So if I'm moving toward this, I'm increasing magnetic field. See if I'm increasing magnetic field is gonna to try to prevent by inducing current. And we don't see that, but there's a magnetic field generated by the loop itself in the opposite direction. So that's why voltage now induced EMF is, you know, toward the left. And you can see, right, the, the charge is moving down to create then a magnetic field is in the opposite direction. And then when it's moving in the opposite direction, which is now I'm decreasing the magnetic field strength, the current in the loop right now is in the opposite direction because it's now again, try to now increase the external magnetic field by pumping magnetic field in the same direction. Okay, that's why there's a two different directions. You know, you can see, right? Again, if I'm moving toward it, it's trying to decrease the external magnetic field. If I'm moving away, then it's trying to increase the external magnetic field. Each time it opposes the change. So that is why there's a two different, let's say direction. All right, so in any case, so this is that simulation that you're gonna use. Hopefully, you know, all this should be enough for you to go and answer all the questions that we have in the, in the, in the lab. And um, just, you know, uh, be aware of that most of those questions actually have two attempts. So when you try once and you, let's say, don't get it right the first time, you can try it again. Unless the question is, you know, kind of like has two answers. If it has two answers, you just have one attempt. Just think about it because you have 50-50 chance, right? But the ones that, you know, you have, you have three or four options, you know, um, I give you two attempts, you know, to get the right answer. All right, guys, so that's it for this one.